Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's virtual program. I'm Emily. I'm one of the librarians here at Rockland Public Library, and we're thrilled to be hosting tonight's author talk with Don Reimer. Uh, I want to start off the night with a couple of quick programming notes on upcoming virtual events here this month at the library. Uh, next week on February 11th, Tim Caverly of Allagash Tales will be providing a Valentine's Day themed presentation on the story of him and his wife, which takes place in part on the trails of Baxter State Park. The following week on February 18th, we have our first virtual film screening of the year. We will be showing tribal justice from the film series POV from PBS. Uh, and I'm happy to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, Don Reimer of Warren Mean is a lifelong birder and photographer. He has served on several local projects relating to bird data, and he has led field excursions for local environmental organizations. His bi-monthly column, Birding with Don Reimer, has appeared in the Rockland Free Press since 2007. And I'll turn it over to Don. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Good evening, everyone. Um, so yes, I have a I have a new book out. It came out in September. It's called Seen Anything Good? Seasons of Birds in Mid-Coast Maine. And the title, that's a little bit misleading because the topics in the book really span a whole lot of other things uh, that pertain outside of the Mid-Coast area. But um, all the experiences and, uh, and the descriptions in there are pretty much from, uh, from local uh, sites. So uh, this, is the, this is the cover photo. It's an osprey that had captured a, an LOI uh, back in May, oh, probably six or eight years ago down here in Warren. And uh, the bird, I was standing on a bridge and the bird flew right at me with the fish uh, in his talons and I had no choice but to take this picture. So both the bird and the fish were paying strict attention when I when I snapped the shot, and I was very fortunate to get get a shot like that. I think. So um, I want to read you just a a paragraph uh, out of the book. It's in the introduction, and I I want to say that um, I I became I became interested in birds when I was just a, a young man, probably six seven years old. My mother we had lots of had some bird feeders and. She was a great nature lover, so that was what sort of got me started. But things were different back then. So this paragraph I'm going to read, this would be in the oh, late um, uh, 1950s, mid-1950s. The number of birders, or bird watchers, as they were termed in those same decades, was limited along the coast. A recollection of seeing two birders probing through roadside shrubbery at Pemquid Point comes to mind. I was intrigued by the binoculars around their necks and, and the purposeful manner of their quest. The pair stood riveted on some obscured bird, seemingly oblivious to the car slowly driving past them a few feet away. With great envy, I pondered what they might be seeing. And I'd already come to understand that bird watchers were an eccentric bunch and perhaps even a bit ditzy. But whether bird watching implied eccentricity or ditziness, it didn't matter to me. I was eager to sign on. And that's sort of the way it was. Uh, I spent uh, pretty much the rest of my life uh, interested in birds and, uh, and lots of experience was with them, lots of citizen science things that I've done. Uh, and what I want to do is to uh, just share with you uh, some of the some of the photos from the book. There are 40 colored photos in there. Uh, this is West Keg Marsh, and probably local folks realize this is Buttermilk Lane here in the background. And and the name of the book, the title, "Seen Anything Good?" That's the typical greeting that uh, birders uh, will say to each other when they meet in the field. Hey, seen anything good? Well, it depends on what you what you mean as good, because uh, it's a relative term and it and it uh, really depends on what your uh, experiences and your expectations are for that day, and and probably uh, in a group like this, these folks all looking at a this happened to be a rare bird, they were looking at it was a rough, which is a Eurasian shorebird, but typically in a group of birders. 
um, there will be folks who might say, gee, that's a great bird. Other people said, well, I've seen a dozen of those. So it's not, you know, it's so, so, but you have to realize, you know, we're used to, all of us around here are used to seeing blue jays. They're pretty common in our feeders in the neighborhood. Uh, if you were in California along the coast of California, that would be a rare bird. That would draw all kinds of people hoping to get a look at that rare bird, which we take for granted here because it's, it's a main bird. And the same thing with, with a chickadee. We, we all have chickadees if we have feeders at all. And uh, in, out in California, that way, they would have different types of chickadees, different species of chickadees. So it is really, uh, it's a relative term, what, what good means. And this is, uh, this is May, this is Warren Village. And every year, there's a, most years, there's a big group of birders who come from all across the region. People come from Pennsylvania. They come up here because they want to take pictures of ospreys catching fish. And there's one thing about the river in Warren, it's narrow and, and the birds just drop right in almost at your feet. And it also is a, birding is a, is a big economic uh, benefit to the state. It draws a lot of people, a lot of money. I mean, how many people do you think have come to Maine hoping to see a puffin, go out to see an Atlantic puffin? So these, these folks, I talked to some of them and one guy told me that he comes up and spends an entire week up here and he probably spends $1,000 or more between lodging and food and gas. And he said, well, I have ospreys at home, but I don't have anything like this. And I can get more pictures here in one day than I can get in an entire season where I live. So it just shows you the value uh, of, uh, of wildlife, of birds, especially here in Maine. Now here, this is my grandson when he was 18 months old. And he was having a good bird day because he was looking at an American robin and he was pretty pleased with that robin. He was pretty pleased with the, with the binoculars. But uh, this is 18 months old and look at him. He was just riveted on that, on that robin. So, um, you know, it just shows you, uh, you know, you can get a lot out of nature. Uh, and it's just, it's a great experience for all of us. So uh, as uh, Emily said, I've been writing a column for the Free Press since 2007. And uh, through the years, I never really intended to write a book. Uh, lots of people approached me and said, geez, when are you gonna write a book? Well, finally I, I did. <laughs> but I've heard so many good things from, from readers, people who say, gee, I, I love your, your, your column. Uh, they used to say, well, I have it on my refrigerator and I mail it to my aunt out in Syracuse. Or, or so forth. So, uh, you know, I've heard, I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from people and I decided, well, I will write a book. So uh, here it is. Um, and actually it's, it's sold uh, so well that I'm, uh, we're gonna be doing a second printing of the book here in, uh, shortly. So um, really, I think being out in nature is just, we all want to get as close to, to birds and animals as we can, so, as we safely can. And uh, it just shows you that you, we all know how trusting a chickadee can be. This was just a random chickadee down in Cushing. I was going along one day, stopped down by the sculpture garden there in uh, Cushing. And uh, there were some chickadees. So I went, I knew I had some bird seed in the car, went back, got a little bird seed in my hand, came back. And um, I just stood by the edge of the alders, went <laughs> Well, that's what chickadees like to hear. So he came and landed right on my hand and just started eating, eating the, the seeds. And I've had quite a few occasions where um, I have rescued, you might say birds, birds that were injured or, or uh, tired sometimes or cold. Uh, this is an example here, this, this hermit thrush, you notice his rusty red tail. He was just alongside the road one spring morning and, and I didn't know if he'd been hit by a car or what, but he, uh, I stopped and I, and I actually was able to pick him up. I brought him home, warmed him up a little bit, went outside and he just flew away like nothing had ever happened. So uh, just lots of experiences like that. There's another, this is a bird that's in my book. 
This is, this is a semi-palmated sandpiper. It's a, it's a fairly common sandpiper in the eastern part of the, of the uh, continent. But notice how the size of it. His head is just about the size of my thumbnail. I was holding him in, in my hand. And he was alongside the road there. I don't know if he had been ticked, you know, flying by a car or whatever, but uh, I was able to capture him. And I took him to Avian Haven eventually next day and, and uh, see what they could do with him. But you have to remember that this little tiny bird here, uh, they nest on the tundra. They, they fly 1,500 miles or more nonstop. And they, they land at West Keg and areas like this, coastal areas where they fatten up. They, they feed day and night for about two weeks. They double their weight. And then the next time they take off, they fly nonstop to South America out over the ocean and just two, two and a half days or so uh, to get to South America. So just incredible uh, feats uh, for birds. So, and here's a, this is, this is in the fall. And this is, uh, this, these are semi-palmated sandpipers. What's interesting about this shot is that the, every one of these is a, you might as well say a baby bird. Uh, they weren't hatched probably more than six weeks prior to this. And yet they have the hardwired instinct to fly from the tundra to Maine and then to pick up and fly to South America. And uh, it's just amazing how, how that happens, how, how they have that connection uh, with, the, with the globe. And that's part of the appeal of my book is just inviting people to sort of sample the wonders of birds, to um, just observe them. And, and especially what's even better than just observing them is watching their behavior. And, and if you've read my columns, you know, you know this is one of my constant themes as to watch the behavior of birds and just see what they do and often they'll do things that you scratch your head and say, oh, why did they do that? So then it becomes your job to figure it out why they did it. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the glory of birds is, is just uh, is seeing what they might do and especially um, species and how they interrelate to each other. That to me is the most interesting part is how different species will, when they're put together in a close environment, what they will do and you'll see a photo here in a little bit of a, of a raven and a red-tailed hawk and, and how they're working things out. And the book has, it has, it's not, it's not a field guide at all in, the, in that sense, but <clears throat> there's a lot of information about identification in there. There's some information about migration, the ecology, the biology of the birds. This is a, this is a Hudsonian godwit. And this is another, you might say, young bird or baby bird these guys, this happened to be Thomaston uh, Flats where I photographed the bird, but this larger shorebird species often overflies the entire North American continent, just over the United States and goes to Cuba or South America nonstop, four, four, four or 5,000 miles. So they're just, just incredible uh, what birds can do. And the birds, the, uh, the book has a variety of, of birds in that are common birds that we, we, we know about, that we see all the time. But you, there might be some information in there about Eastern bluebirds, for example, that you weren't aware of. In fact, we have, we have four in our yard uh, every day now. They've been out here uh, picking on some berries, just like this guy here, this male Eastern bluebird. They've made a big comeback since the, uh, days when uh, uh, you know the, the bluebird trails were established to give them places to nest. And then there are rare birds in there. This is probably one of the rarest birds that we've seen in Maine, that we had seen in Maine uh, ever. This is a great black hawk. It's a Mexican desert hawk, which somehow ended up in Portland, Maine. It, uh, it crossed the country. They, they, it was seen in Texas, the very same bird. And uh, the next time it was detected, it was in Biddeford and then uh, at Deering Oaks in Portland for, oh, a couple of months. And unfortunately, uh, being a desert bird, a bare-legged bird, uh, it, it uh, succumbed to frostbite and they, they actually had to euthanize the bird, which was, was a shame. But 
I'll tell you the, again, the economic value to the city of Portland was incredible. People came from all over the country to see this bird. So go figure, you know. So this is, was the great Black Hawk. It was a young bird, but uh, nevertheless, it, it had made it all the way here. I have a story about that in there. And what's even more amazing, I guess as amazing as a guy named Eddie, who's a birder. And he, uh, he was actually in Texas when the bird was there. He moved to Maine and guess what? The bird showed up just about the same time he did. So go figure again. Uh, we, we occasionally get unusual or rare birds along the coast here. And this is a white pelican. Uh, it was uh, down uh, off Tennant's Harbor and it spent oh, a week or so up here, uh, probably uh, carried up here or by a storm. We had, we'd had a large storm just prior to that. This great big bird, huge bird uh, was, was around and uh, for, for a week or more. Here's another bird that really had no business being in Rockland, Maine back in 2010. This is called a bronze cowbird. It's another Mexican bird. It's, it, it's a bird that has red eyes and not a lot of birds have red eyes, but there was a fellow uh, in the neighborhood there who was a birder, a very good birder. And he looked out and saw this flock of blackbirds and he noticed that one of them had, the eyes were a different color and be darned if it wasn't a bronzed a cowbird. And that was the first time one had been recorded in New England. So that shows you again, uh, what, what can happen. And the funny thing about this bird is that uh, when it got on the bird hotline, uh, we, we realized that a lot of people would probably come and see it or try to see it, and they did. But they were nice, someone was nice enough to go and inform the neighbors that there was probably a bunch of nice people coming into the neighborhood, but they were harmless. So that was good. We got some, at least they got some advanced warning about us. And sometimes people, uh, you may have seen me sometimes in parking lots uh, with a box of cereal and I'm not eating it. Uh, I sometimes, I've, for years, I've been paying special attention to gulls because you find a lot of gulls with leg bands on them for one thing. And I've gotten, I've gotten quite a few uh, returns on leg bands uh, from the numbers on the leg bands. But this bird here, this was behind the Thompson grocery store. I drove in one morning and here was this bird that with a bunch of ring-billed gulls, which is, was closely related to, this is a mew gull, which is a European uh, gull. And uh, when I saw that it had no band on the, on the bill, like a ring bill would, I started really looking at it and be darned, it was, it was a mew gull. And just, just an amazing uh, bird to be here in Maine. And I've spent quite a bit of, quite a few old lonely nights out doing owl studies. I did one up in the Palermo area for uh, over a decade and uh, a lot of fun, uh, cold, a little bit scary sometimes, depending on what vehicles are going by with, you know, broken mufflers and so forth. But uh, very interesting stuff. And of course, owls are starting to nest now. Great horned owls are probably already nested and they'll be followed by barred owls and sawwet owls and so forth. So, uh, and, here, and here's a barred owl right here. This, this guy uh, was out in my backyard and he was got mobbed by crows. They were just picking on him every day. And finally, the poor thing just it sneaked away somewhere, I guess. But uh, crows love to harass owls. If they see an owl, they will go out of their way, right out of the area. Barred owls are the most common owl we have around here. It's a brown-eyed owl. So any owl that you see in Maine with brown eyes, 99%, it's a, it's a uh, barred owl. Uh, great horned owls have yellow eyes. These guys, snowy owls, they have yellow eyes. It's been a, a pretty good winter for snowy owls. They've been at the Portland Jet Port. There's been some over Clary Hill Way. Uh, Beat Hill, some of those places, any place where there's, where there's barrens, where there's uh, uh, low uh, growth. Uh, the air, airport's a good, Owlshead Airport, I, one time I saw three there 
all in one binocular view. That was one exceptional winter when they were just down here in droves. But this has been a good year as well. And sometimes bad things happen to good owls. Here is a here's a great horned owl that had had captured a crow. What they do, they'll go into a crow roost at night and try to pick off a you know get a get a crow. And this owl had 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 captured a crow and was flying across Route 17 early one morning. He and his victim both got hit by a car and there they lay together on the pavement. The owl still attached to the crow. He just had his talons firmly right into his flesh. Uh, interesting, interesting stuff. If you're looking, you're gonna see. That's, that's my motto. You have to, have to be curious. You have to look around, be prepared, be prepared. I always have my camera with me when I'm out in the car. And of course we have lots of hawks around here red-tailed hawks in the wintertime, they're, they're all over the place. If you see a big bulky hawk on a, on a utility pole or on a line or uh, in a hardwood tree somewhere and he has a big white chest, it's gonna be a red-tailed hawk. They're, they're a mouse-eating hawk. They'll, they'll catch squirrels as well, gray squirrels, but it takes them a couple of years to get that red tail. The first year is sort of a, a gray uh, striped tail. Very uh, powerful uh, raptor. And you don't want those to get a hold of your hand. I was at a banding station one time, they'd captured one and the fellow said that he had been uh, footed by them, meaning that it had, one had grabbed him before and he said it was not a fun thing. He cried, he said. And of course we have peregrine falcons around now. This one was in, uh, in Rockland Harbor. Uh, there's a pair that, that winters around between Rockland Harbor and the cement plant. Most winters is also a, a, a pair in, in Camden and they love pigeons. They will, in the morning, they'll come and chase pigeons around uh, the place uh, and they, they're pretty effective. They usually get one, they usually get their breakfast. This was a large female falcon here who was carrying her, her prey over to, she went to the top of a mast on one of the wind jammers in the harbor and started plucking the feathers off. And before you know it, it looked just like a Purdue chicken. She just picked it so clean. You could see all the, the, um, uh, the skin, just, just like a chicken you'd buy at the supermarket. It took her about 45 minutes, but she ate the whole entire bird. So very powerful uh, bird. Testing again in Maine. Um, they actually nest on the on the uh, towers on the roof over at uh, Dragon Cement now. There's a pair that's done very well there. And there's a pair over at uh, Camden State Park. Uh, any place where there's a high, they have to have a high uh, airy to, to, uh, to, uh, to be and they want, they have to feel safe and they wanna be up high where they can, they can look around and see prey as well. So here, one of, the, one of my stories about interactions between species, <clears throat> and this is, this is a big male raven. You can see just how big he is. And it's, it's a, a red-tailed hawk, which is also a male, I believe, because it's small. All the uh, birds of prey, all the raptors, the females are larger, sometimes up to a third larger than the males. But just quickly, uh, my wife and I had a 12-pound oh, turkey in our freezer one fall, and just before Thanksgiving, we had a big snowstorm. We lost the power for about four days, and it was very cold, but it wasn't cold enough to keep the turkey, frozen turkey, frozen. So when we got the power back, my wife said, you need to throw that turkey away because it's no good, it's spoiled. Well, I felt of it, and it didn't, it didn't feel, it still felt hard, so I decided that I would just keep it for a while. And uh, so a, a month later, I drug it out of the freezer, went out back and tethered it to a clothesline pole. And I just wanted to see what would happen. Who would come? Would eagles come? Would gulls come? Who would come? And my wife thought that this was a waste of time. 
But one day she was doing dishes and looking out in the backyard and she suddenly screamed. She said, oh my God. Well, there was a bald eagle standing right on top of the turkey, just ripping, ripping the flesh off it. So, and shortly after that, this, this huge raven showed up. They're, they're almost twice the size of a crow. They're just huge birds, great big, notice the bill there. And he pretty much took charge of the yard. He bossed everybody around except the eagles, but he bossed all the gulls and the, all the hawks, everybody that came here. This guy would actually just walk out, spread his wings and just walk toward them, sort of like Herman Munster, just open his big uh, bill there and threaten them. And they would leave, they would all leave. And if you notice in the photo, this red tail is leaned right back. His tail is pushed in the snow He's leaned back because he's probably never been treated so rudely as this, this occasion. So uh, again, behavior watching, it's a lot of fun. And then uh, key vultures. I spent a couple of years, I spent one year trying to find a nest because I was working on the uh, main bird atlas, which is a, a five year uh, program to figure out what birds live in Maine and where they are and how many there are, that type of thing. If they nest here, that's the, that's the big part of it. And at the, after, on the first year of the study in 2018, uh, I saw all kinds of vultures flying around, but I never found a nest. And then at the end of the season, a lady called me and said, uh, are you still interested in vultures? She said, because they nest right behind my house and they have for about 20 years. So the next spring I went over there and sure enough, down in the big cave out, way out in the oak woods, uh, there was this nest of uh, turkey vultures. And uh, very fascinating birds. You wouldn't expect maybe that the, the young birds, the juveniles would be white, but they're downy white. And this guy, they, they grow the feathers really rapidly because you can see wing feathers maybe in the back there, but they're just, there's nothing to do with them. They're just growing out and his wings don't even, even pick up yet. They're just sort of there. So I had a lot of fun uh, studying these birds, watching them. I went back about once a week and took uh, some quick photos of how they were growing. And uh, some of you may have been to the, my presentation on these, on these guys, on turkey vultures, but uh, fascinating birds. Uh, and they, of course, they're not a songbird, so they have they don't have any way of, of singing. They ha don't have a syrinx in their throat like a robin does. All they can do is hiss, and they do hiss. They hit, sound like a big snake hissing at you uh, when you come around. So that that was a lot of fun. I learned a lot uh, from from these birds just watching them uh, grow up. The, the the book has some unusual birds. This isn't a rare bird, but it's unusual. It's called a blue-gray gnat catcher. And it, it's a bird that just barely makes it into Maine. There may be a few nesting records, but they're smaller than a chickadee. They're uh, just perky little guys and they often uh, have their tail up in that uh, erect posture. They're really uh, pretty spirited little birds. So that's a blue-gray gnat catcher. And then we of the common warblers. This is called a chestnut-sided warbler. And it's one of my favorite warblers because of uh, its history. Back in the days when uh, um, Audubon was, was going, he passed through Maine on his way to Labrador. And in his entire life, as much as Audubon was out in the, in the woods, he was probably more than anyone else, anyone I ever knew of, he only saw two of these birds his entire life. And that's because we had mature uh, spruce forest here then. There was no secondary growth, very little. Uh, and that's what these birds, this species needs is secondary growth. This just bushy, low bushy stuff, brushy things, environments, habitats. And I've said before, if in the springtime in June, if you were to just ride around with your windows down, go on some of these side roads away from traffic, and you would hear these birds singing everywhere. It's sort of like, please, please, please to meet you. It's emphasized on the end, emphatic. 
uh, we could probably ride around and find 40 of those in an hour if we wanted to. So that's how things change. Shows you also the effects of habitat on things. How uh, without habitat, you know, nothing, nothing really uh, does that well. It can, because that's that's where where it's intended to be is in this type of habitat. So that's chestnut-sided warbler. Great little bird. And that's a nice male. You can see the chestnut extending down, down his uh, breast there, down his chest. And then uh, sparrows over at West Keg Marsh and uh, Scarborough Marsh, any of our big salt marshes here in Maine. This is called a sharp-tailed sparrow, Nelson's sharp-tailed sparrow. And if you look at the tail feathers, you can see how it gets its name, these pointy little feathers. And these birds uh, nest right in the, in the marsh itself, along the ditches over there. And uh, it's a challenge because what they have to do is to time their nesting between monthly high tide cycles. So they have, it takes about 10, 12 days to hatch the eggs. So what they have to do is construct a real quick nest, lay the eggs, incubate the eggs, and get the young uh, fledged so that if a, if a tide come, big tide comes, the young uh, sparrows can actually fl climb up on the stalks and get out of the water. But it's amazing how these birds can adapt to the tide cycles and they have to, that's what they've always done for thousands or millions of years, we don't know, but a long time. And they're one of the species, they and their, they have a, uh, another uh, sort of a cousin called the salt marsh sparrow, which does the same thing. They, their uh, future is somewhat uh, uh, in question because of the increasingly high tides that we're getting uh, all the time and, and we are, it is, it's creeping up gradually and uh, we don't know at some point if these birds will be able to adapt to that or not, but they're, they're trying, they're certainly trying right now. I think this is my final slide uh, for, for the book and this is an American woodcock, timber doodle, they're called sometimes. It's a shorebird and, and most shorebirds have long pointy wings, but these guys have little short stubby wings because they're, they nest in uh, thick, dense cover, alder swamps and places like that. And they need to be able to just get up between the trees when they, when they fly out. They were the first, one of the first birds to, spring birds to arrive here each year. Usually in March, they even come, this, this one is standing in snow, so you can see the snow doesn't really bother them that much. And what they do is to find muddy places or little weeps where they can go and put that long bill down into the dirt. And, uh, and uh, mostly they, kept, they eat a lot of earthworms and that, that bill can actually open up at the end, sort of flexible like your fingers can, the tip of it is flexible and it can grab worms under the, under the, uh, the turf. Their brain is actually uh, put in there uh, backwards or upside down because uh, in order to be safe, when they put their bill down into the, into the uh, earth, the only thing that they, their eyes are sticking up and they don't know uh, if there's predators around or not, but they, they, they can because they're, uh, it's unique, and, uh, but it works for them. And that's what, they, that's what they need to do to survive is to have this, this odd, uh, a combination of, of uh, features. But a beautiful bird, they're actually a game bird in Maine. Uh, not much meat on them, but uh, they are a game bird. And here's some places where I have books right now. Owl and Turtle, Sherman's books, they're selling them a lot of books. Archipelago in, uh, in Rockland. And I, I noticed they've been closed for the month of January. I don't know what their plans are for reopening in February, but they, they bought quite a number of my books as well. And of course you can get it on Amazon or on my website, or you could get it uh, through Main Authors Publishing. Uh, I probably misspelled that, but anyhow, mainauthorspublishing.com. And what I, uh, you know, I love to sell books. I sold quite a few on Amazon, but what I like to ask people is to patronize your local bookstores because, uh, you know, 
they're a great asset to us. And it would, it would just be a shame to lose, you know, some of these stores. Uh, you know, I, I just, even if I'm not going to buy a book, I like being in a bookstore because it's so fun to browse and just see what's out there. Uh, and as I said, I'm, I'm uh, into it. We're going to have a second printing of the book here uh, in the coming weeks. So I still have some some left, but uh, that's the plan. I'm happy about that, that, you know, that it is selling well and people I'm getting a lot of, uh, quite a few uh, compliments. What people seem to like about it uh, is that uh, it's, it's a series of short essays and they take five or 10 minutes to read and people like that. They tell me that, uh, you know, they, they pick it up, they read, read a couple and then they, they can go back to it. One fellow told me that I'm the last uh, thing that he reads at night. He has it on his nightstand and he'll read a chapter or two uh, at bedtime. So uh, that, that's good to hear. Uh, and uh, I, guess I'll, I guess I'll turn it back uh, to Emily and see if people, uh, if you have any questions, any bird questions or comments or whatever you want to say. Uh, okay, Emily. Excellent, thanks, Don. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat and I'll read them aloud for you. Or if you'd like, feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. Lester asks, what do you think of the proliferation of turkeys we see these days? Of, of turkeys? Is that what the question is about yep. turkeys? <laughs> proliferation of turkeys, yeah. yep. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't want to say anything bad about a bird, but there are a lot of them right now. You know, they were introduced twice. The first time it didn't work because the state uh, set out some turkeys around Southern Maine. I think it was back in the 1970s. And um, it, it wasn't very successful at all. But the second uh, time that they did that, the birds obviously caught on. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're just everywhere. I mean, the, you can see, uh, 30, 40 in a, in a farm field, some of these big fields at times. In the season, I think they've increased the bag limit a little bit, which maybe they, maybe they should. Uh, they, they, I think one of the reasons why they do so well is they are a hardy bird and they can even rake down through, you know, quite a bit of snow. They eat acorns and apples and stuff a lot. Yeah, but the other thing in their favor is that they roost in trees at night. They're not a bird uh, that uh, is on the ground a lot. So they're probably spared a lot of, uh, of uh, damage by doing that. Uh, it's amazing that for such a big bird, they can just fly straight up into a tree. It's just incredible to see. Um, so, you know, year, years ago, uh, well, I don't want to spoil my book, but I'll tell you a quick one that I was at West Keg Marsh one time in the parking lot and this truck went by going like blazes. He went up the hill and just as he got up the top of the hill, he struck this great big Tom Turkey with thud. I could hear it way down the road, bang, feathers are flying. So I went up to get the, retrieve the bird, just get it out of the road. It was right, in the, right on the center line. And when I had gotten to the side of the road, these two fellows with a, in a sports car with the top down and a big dog in the back slammed their brakes on and came to a stop and said, are you gonna eat that thing? And I said, no. <laughs> so they, they, they took the dog back home because they didn't think that would work well having it in the back seat with the dog. They came back and, and, and took the turkey home to eat, I guess. So that's, that's about all I know about turkeys. They're, uh, they're doing very well. Who else out there? Noel asks, how can we participate in the bird count? I have plenty in my yard. Uh, well, well, the Christmas bird count, I can just talk about that briefly. Uh, that's, those are all set up uh, in a 15 mile circle and uh, it's a fixed circle. You can't go outside of it. So uh, if, his, if, his, uh, if his home is within the 15 mile circle, we could count any birds around his neighborhood uh, that came to his feeders or whatever. Uh, for the Rockland Thomaston count, I have a, a number of people who, uh, who do that, who feeder watch 
um, during the day of the Christmas. It's, all, it's only one day you can count them, whatever the day we designate. And uh, then they'll either email or, or phone me in the, the results. But, uh, you know, it, it, we're always looking for more data. And if anyone who is, uh, resides in one of those circles, Pemco Dammer Scotter is another local one. Uh, uh, this one in Belfast. They're not just everywhere because uh, it, takes, it takes quite a few people to run one to actually cover the territory. But I would say if, if, uh, if this person uh, lives anywhere within the, the 15 mile count circle, which is sort of centered at the, for Rockland, at the uh, um, uh, Montpelier, whatever, whatever that's called there, the, the, the uh, mansion there in Thompson, that's sort of the center of the circle there. And it goes out seven and a half miles all around it. So I, I guess that's for now, that's all I can really say about it. And this year we, because of the virus, we didn't uh, form teams and ride around in cars together or anything because we just felt it wasn't probably the best idea. Someone's looking for um, binocular recommendations specifically. Are there any good binoculars for children? Hmm, children. Well, um, there's yeah, there's lot there's lots of binoculars out there that in every just about every company makes so-called cheap binoculars and expensive binoculars, and it doesn't mean that you have to spend a thousand dollars to get a good pair of binoculars. Two or three hundred dollars now. Uh, some of the Nikon uh, binoculars, they're great. They're terrific binoculars, but you probably want something with. Um, uh, well, it depend, I guess it would depend on the age of the child, but uh, a lot of people, birders like to have something like in the uh, oh, 8, 842 range, 8 meaning 8 powered and 42 meaning the size of the, the binocular lens, the front lens. And uh, so all I'll say is that you don't, you don't need to spend a fortune uh, to get some blunt binoculars that are you can see very well with they've improved them a lot because there's so much interest in bird watching now uh, companies have actually designed binoculars with bird watching in mind certain features like close focus and stuff like that a lot of a lot of birders also in the in the middle of the day uh, go butterfly watching because there's not often that's not a busy time for the birds but it's when the butterflies and the insects are at their at their peak so uh, there's, I know lots of people who actually have learned a lot about butterflies and become somewhat expert uh, on butterflies. So I guess the, I, that's about all I can say for now on that. Lori asks, are Baltimore Orioles unusual here? Um, they, no, they're not unusual, but they, uh, in the summer, they're, they're a common nesting bird. Uh, their nests are, are hard to see because they're they're uh, up high usually. It's like a big little pocketbook thing hanging down, pendulous nest they call it. But uh, when the leaves go off, all of a sudden you go, "Geez, I drove under that nest all summer and I didn't even know it was there." Uh, occasionally they'll hang around in the winter. This year, well, like most years, uh, there were a few here and there that uh, hang out at people's bird feeders. Uh, because, you know, if they've got some, they can get some suet or I know well, she was treating them like royalty. They were, she was getting them grapes and oranges and all kinds of stuff, mealworms. Uh, she was really, those, that Oriole got treated very, very well. Kathy asks, I have a young red-bellied woodpecker and a blue jay that stayed together in my yard since last spring. How long do you think they will stay together? Wow, that's a good one. And that's a good question. I'd have to get my crystal ball out for that one, but uh, it's interesting that they that they come around there together. I'm wondering if they that they both come to the feeders and so forth and sort of established a friendship, uh, companionship that way or, or what, but uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's hard to speculate on how long they will to hang together, but there's a species, a red-bellied woodpecker, that has come a long, long way. In the past uh, oh, 20 years, they 30 years ago they would have been a rare bird in Maine, and now uh, they're uh, 
almost a common bird. We have we have a pair that nest every uh, year in our neighborhood. They'll you'll bring usually have a couple of young. That's a bird that it was used. To, it was a southeastern woodpecker, mostly from the southeast. And now they're established well up into Maine, even beyond the coast areas. So uh, quite amazing, really, how, how things can change. Lester asks, can you comment on why I tend to see one or two tufted titmice hanging out in a flock of chickadees? Why aren't there as many titmice as there are chickadees? And why do they hang out together? Well, uh, they're closely, fairly closely related. Uh, they used to say they were like cousins because they're 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 pretty much in the same family. They're called parids, P-A-R-I-D, parids. And uh, I don't know, chicken. Uh, the the tit mice aren't quite as prolific, I guess, as uh, as the chickadees. But uh, you'll often see them uh, together, see them around together. Uh, those are two of the first birds that show up at my feeders in the morning. And when you're on some of those bitter cold mornings, we haven't had a lot of real cold this winter, but some morning when it's super cold, be watching out your feeders and you'll notice that chickadees and sometimes the uh, titmice, the end of the tail will be bent like a sort of a U shape. And that's because uh, to stay warm during the night, they got into a tight cavity somewhere, just trying to be a little bit warmer. and. Uh, it, it sometimes it's quite pronounced, the J shape in their tail, just from compression alone. But uh, yeah, they're closely related and the behaviors are really you know, quite a bit alike as well. Excellent. Well, if no one else has a question, I think that'll do it for tonight. Thank you so much for, to everyone for coming. Thank you so much to Don for a really, really fascinating talk. And uh, have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Night, everyone.